I'd like to give you some insights about some recent developments. So about three and a half years ago, we have published a German version of this article, the so-called Digital Manifesto, and a lot of things have actually changed since then. There is, for example, a PhD program at UDF that I'm coordinating called Engineering Social Technologies for a Responsible Digital Future. And but that has actually triggered some thinking worldwide, I would think, uh, in this direction of value sensitive design. IEEE, the biggest engineering uh, association, came up with this ethically aligned design guidelines. The European Union came up with also their own guidelines on artificial intelligence, robotics and autonomous systems and just recently, a few days ago, the OECD came up with recommendations for artificial intelligence. On the other hand, we are seeing that not anymore anything goes. Um, big ID companies are getting into trouble because they basically cross red lines and they have to pay billions for wrongdoing and this concerns not only Google, also Apple has recently been sued for a billion because one student was arrested falsely based on face recognition and most likely I guess he's going to get that amount of money. Facebook is putting on the side uh, several billions of dollars because they have violated privacy laws. While Mark Zuckerberg previously said privacy is dead, the new slogan of the company seems to be the future is private. And while before Facebook was basically uh, promoting the motto move fast, break things, now most likely Facebook will be broken up. Because it's not just Facebook, it's also Instagram, it's WhatsApp, you know, these are companies that should compete with each other. This company got too much power and it has, uh, it seems, interfered with elections and other bad things have happened, including also the fake news epidemics and so on. But there's another problem, and the main problem of the world these days is lack of sustainability. We know about this problem actually since the 70s of the past century. The Limit to Growth study has opened our eyes about the limitations of resources. And there have been many other reports that basically suggest that within this century and maybe very soon you would run into trouble, it could be economic crisis, it could be population crisis, and there are books like this that basically tell us that we need to learn to die in this time. Well, previously this has happened in wars. Now people are discussing about other whistles that we decide about life and death. And of course you know all these trolley problems. This is exactly about this question. How to deal with the population implications of lack of sustainability? It's not about traffic. There is a much bigger problem to be decided. And I think this is a really big and serious problem for whatever reason this slide doesn't want to show. In order to keep trouble small, comparatively, the United Nations came up with the Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. There are 11 years left in order to reach these goals, it's pretty clear will fail to reach these goals on time if we don't change the system and our approach dramatically. Worst comes to worst, it turns out that the digital revolution seems to reduce sustainability and increase inequality. So it's not going to be the solution to all of our problems. On the contrary, energy consumption by digital tools are increasing, is increasing exponentially and by 2030, at the time when we should be sustainable, it's expected that 29 percent of all energy will be 
consumed by those devices. So this year we need to have a new approach, a different kind of digitalization, a sustainable one, where we need to have a new organization of our society and the economy altogether. If we want to go through these rough times in a good way. And here I want to point out that networks are game changers. They have the potential to change everything, to the worse or to the better, depending on whether we learn to use them to our advantage. In a highly networked world, often the intended effects don't happen. Instead, we will have side effects or feedback effects or cascading effects. Such a world is highly complex. Linear thinking often fails. Today we have these supply chains where we use fresh resources and then come up with products that are consumed for some time, then we throw them away. We have top down control systems in many areas. I claim this is about to fail because of the complexity of those highly networked systems. And such a society cannot be steered like a car. We know this. So yes, uh, I don't know why. We'll get this going anyway. So even if we could really read the minds of all these people, those undesired outcomes, that in general would still happen. It's because of interaction effects. There's a systemic instability where small variations will be amplified and basically the system gets out of control. Something unintended happens. However, there is a solution to this problem. And it's called mechanism design. It's not centralized control. It's changing the interactions between the vehicles, of course, with digital technology, but it can be done in such a way that the traffic flow will be stabilized and capacity will be increased in a decentralized way. So the secret of success is real-time measurement and real-time feedback. And I think we need a new paradigm, basically to go from top-down control to self-organizing systems. Here is a funny example of such a system. A video that I made in Egypt, and you can see this system seems to self organize quite nicely despite the high diversity of participants. Nobody seems to be waiting over here. Of course, we don't want to have that kind of system because there's a lot of honking and noise and so on, and it's maybe also not entirely safe, but now with the Internet of Things, we can build a self-organizing system. That means 300 years after the idea of the invisible hand has been accepted, the Internet of Things can make it work. But it requires knowledge of complexity science. Now, if we want to optimize, for example, urban traffic flow and reduce the emissions, then basically we have to solve a highly complex coordination problem where capacity easily gets lost. Because of these minimum functions that we see over here. So if you do the wrong thing, and that happens very easily, basically you lose capacity or get congestion. Now, we've been inspired by a South Asian principle that we found in bottlenecks. And pedestrians are trying to pass those bottlenecks. They're oscillatory flows that come about <coughs> through self-organization based on a pressure principle. And uh, we basically <coughs> said that intersections are something like bottlenecks too. And why don't we have the traffic flows control the traffic lines rather than the other way around? And in fact, it works so nicely that uh, we get green waves based on self-organization. The question is, how efficient is this as compared to the approach that we have today? Today we basically have a traffic control center and then a better working dictator. It collects as much data as possible, then it's trying to come up with the perfect plan to, to impose it on the entire city. 
Just the problem is it's an NP hard optimization problem and cannot be solved in real time. So we can take another approach and have every intersection <coughs> control the traffic lights independently <coughs> in a decentralized way based on travel time minimization. Then, however, we wouldn't have a coordination between different intersections. But it would work a little bit like this principle of homo economicus. Every intersection tries to do the best thing locally. And then there is a third approach, which does the same thing, just if there's a long traffic jam, it will first be clear before we go back to travel time minimization. So intuitively, we would expect that this is going to be the best, because it's actually coordinated. That's going to be the second best. And this other regarding approach, that pays attention to the neighboring intersections, is going to be the worst approach. Let's see what really happens. The red line shows you how the Q length of waiting vehicles increases on average with capacity utilization of the intersection. It turns out there's a linear increase with the traffic volume and that makes a lot of sense. Now how does actually this selfish optimization based on a homo economicus principle work? Well, actually that works much better over here. Right? It's like uh, doing the best thing locally is better than this periodic uh, optimized control scheme. But then suddenly there is an explosion of the key length. So we can say that Adam's municipal hand works very well over here, but it fails over there. And that's why traffic control centers will tell you that's why you're paying millions of a year to us to sort out this problem. But the third approach turns out to be better all the way. That means if you optimize locally and pay attention to your neighbors, it's going to create a very good coordination and this will make the invisible hand work, all based on a decentralized approach. And actually, we haven't just done it for a Manhattan network or a Barcelona network, but for a really complex network over here in Dresden, this area was one where the traffic authorities were not happy with the solution that they had. Of course, they bought the best one that was available in the market, and that offers a green wave, which is even adaptive, but they wanted also to prioritize, uh, prioritize public transport. And unfortunately, there are so many different tram lines cutting through this area, and if you would prioritize those trams, basically you would interrupt the green waves, and that would cause a terrible traffic jam in a very short time. We came up with this self-optimization approach and compared it with this AOVR control and it looks differently even though also green waves are occurring. And now the question is, how well does it work? And it turns out there are massive gains for public transport, but not at the cost of individualized traffic. And pedestrian and cyclists also have a lot of gains and the environment too. So that means if we have traffic flows control the traffic lights in a bottom-up way, we can actually manage traffic much better because of this complexity of the optimization problem. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to have a second phase of the digitization, a different one, digitization to the cloud, where we pursue a minimally invasive approach as it's now, for example, from chaos control. And obviously we need more wisdom rather than more power. We need to understand complex systems in order to make those optimization forces work for us. And so let's come back to this uh, subject. How to engineer a more responsible digital future? We need to learn to design for values, to build in those values. So that means engineers need to learn about 
the values of our society, constitutional values and also cultural values. Those systems should be culturally adaptive. They should adapt to the users. So we need to learn to design for values, for privacy, sustainability, democracy, participation, safety, transparency, and so on. And first of all, we need to learn to design for humans. These systems should serve humans, not the other way around. And we can learn to design for democracy. So what are the values that matter over here? It's human rights, human dignity, freedom, self-determination, pluralism, protection of minorities, division of power, checks and balances, participation, transparency, fairness, justice, legitimacy, and anonymous equal votes. And finally, privacy in the sense of protection from misuse and exposure and the right to be left alone. Now one critical question is really who owns our data, our personal data, our digital double. And there is a very detailed digital double about every one of us. It's just not controlled by you. And this is not compatible actually with the Constitution because Human dignity implies that, first of all, people shouldn't be monitored all the time and not know who is observing them and what's happening with their data. Um, second of all, they should have a say what's happening with their data and third of all, they should have informational self-determination. And if we don't implement this, this does not only have fundamental implications for the individual, but also for free democratic societies that can't work long term anymore. And I think this is really a serious thing that needs to be fixed and it can be fixed. Because we, we just have to build another software layer that would give individuals control over their personal data. Right? So there would be a personal data mailbox or something and you would have the password that allows you to determine what kind of data could be used by what companies or institutions for what purposes, period of time and price. And so there would be a competition of companies and institutions for this data and for our trust. And that competition for trust will create a trusted digital society. Of course, governments and um, science should be able to make statistics, but um, apart from this, when it comes to personalized products and services, we should decide ourselves. This approach allows for all personalized services and products. It will increase trust. It will also increase benefits for the economy altogether. Because not only big IT companies would have access to personal data, but also small and medium-sized companies, spin-off companies, scientific institutions, NGOs. So the value of data would really be fully unleashed and not just by a few big companies. That would really boost the digital progress in Europe. And so this is really about a participatory new economy that unleashes the power of combinatorial innovation. Now this is the approach that we have seen in the past. Cybernetics combining synergy uh, that created a cyber system such as you know it from Chile and of course now we have that in Singapore and we have it in China and by the way we have it in Switzerland and Europe too. Um, but there is a different way of combining these two things. Synergy and cybernetics would give synergetics. That is the science of self-organizing complex systems. And it's really about understanding how to turn a digital desert into a digital rainforest, a rich ecosystem, which is based on the principle of symbiosis. 
an ecosystem, in fact, where all different players would potentially benefit from each other. And in order to show you how powerful this principle is, I'd like to show you a simulation that we did in order to check this paradigm of formal economic was a selfish man. And so the simulation makes the following assumptions. Agents representing human society according to a best response rule that strictly maximizes their utility function. Given the behavior of their interaction partners, that mean their neighbors. And that utility function, this is an economic thinking, considers not only the own payoff, but potentially gives a certain way to the payoff of the interaction partners, of the neighbors, right? And this way is called friendliness, but it's set to zero for everyone at the beginning of the simulation. I mean, everyone starts selfish, right? But there is this genetic principle. Friendliness is a trait that is inherited to offspring, and the likelihood to have an offspring increases exclusively with the own payoff, not the utility transfer. Of course, you have to pay for the food and the housing and all this, right? And moreover, the payoff is assumed to be zero when a friendly agent is exploited by the neighbors, because they're selfish. And uh, so those agents, these friendly agents, ne never have any offspring, like, like Jesus. And, and then finally, the inherent friendliness are varies a little bit there's implication, as we know it also from biology. So what happens if we simulate these very plausible assumptions? Well, it turns out to take homo economicus results for most parameter combinations, as economists would really say. But there is an area where homo socialis results in other regarding people who are friendly to others who have other regarding preferences. And this happens actually when offspring, the children are grown up close to their parents. And this is actually what humans do, actually, quite exceptionally for almost 20 years, right? This makes us social, in other words. And there's a huge benefit on learning to be other regarding, and we pay attention to the neighbors, and network minds in a sense, you can see that it takes many generations until the nation cooperation actually emerges and becomes dominant. And before people have these other regarding references, that cooperation is very costly. That means these selfish takes off for a long time, for many generations, but then eventually when people get friendly towards each other, it creates a better world for everyone. And that means cooperating people have a much larger benefit than those who try to exploit others. And so, in fact, over time, people will develop a certain friendliness value, 40% approximately. And we know this from experiments that most humans are actually not selfish, there's some of them, but most humans have some pro social preferences, right? And already Adam Smith knew about it. Just economics didn't want to know about it for a long time. But it has a huge potential, those network thinking effects that can, first of all, overcome. Uh, war, but second of all, really create huge benefits through cooperation. And so basically, I think we could build a new kind of economy which is not based on exploitation of people and environment, but by using previously overlooked opportunities. So every day we're basically passing by other people. You're standing at the bus stop, tram stop, train station, whatever. In many cases, we don't talk to these people, but they share interests with us, and we could do something with them. We could do projects, beneficial projects, but because we don't know who are the right people to do the project we're interested in, we're not talking to them. Digital assistance could help us to identify them, to set up projects, 
to support our awareness, the interaction between people, and to make sure that we'll have a lot more beneficial interactions. We could build systems that create interoperability in this highly diverse world. Let's take the example of real-time translation. This is something that we have right now. But we could also build something like cultural guides and allow us to understand the success principles of other countries. Because every country is full of thousands of success principles. Why don't we build a cultural PTR, a cultural genome project that brings together that knowledge and allows us to combine those success principles of different countries around the world to address the big challenges that we're faced with. In fact, that brings us to digital democracy. And I think all of this is about boosting collective intelligence, right? I mean, learning to bring the best ideas of many minds together. Now, the interesting point about collective intelligence is that whenever there is a complex problem, one perspective is not good enough to give a good view of the problem and to deliver a good solution. It's the combination of the best individual solution with other solutions, inferior solutions apparently, but the combination comes up with a much better solution that works for many people. That means diversity wins, not the best. So it's not about majorities, it's about combining different perspectives and solutions. And this would strengthen our societies. And we could build platforms that help us to bring those ideas together. But now there's often this question, should more successful people have more voting power? And surprisingly, experiments say no. Right? So democracy is right about this point. If we have a, sym a symmetry in terms of equal power, that actually drives the system towards better and better solutions. And there's even mathematical proofs that a symmetrical system would find their way towards an optimal outcome. Now the question is how to take climate action. We've read about all of those demonstrations and they're quite impactful, and putting a lot of pressure on politicians these days. Uh, classically, nation states and the United Nations were trying to come up with a solution, but that's not enough. And so global cooperation comes into the game and say, you know, we're going to build a system, just tell us what we should do. Um, and of course, they make a lot of money. But it's not enough. We had 50 years to fix the problem. We are far off a solution to the problem, so we need additional means. And here is the third pillar that I recommend. Countering global problems bottom up through City Olympics, a friendly competition between cities and regions to identify new solutions to the world's problems, such as climate change, energy efficiency, sustainability, resilience, and peace, for example. And so there will be a new principle called localization rather than globalization, which is about thinking global, but acting local and diverse, making experiments, learning from each other, and helping each other. Those solutions of the City Olympics, and we are now engaging in something we call Time City Camp, those would be open source and creative commons. That means all those solutions could be developed further, they could be combined, they could be used by companies, by NGOs. Cities could combine those solutions. So it's about combining competition and cooperation worldwide, and so to create a network of innovative, participatory cities to combine the best ideas around the world to solve our problems. That means we need to upgrade smart cities with collective intelligence and collective action. Otherwise, we're not going to make it by 2030 or 40. And now, how to solve the 
sustainability problem. Well, also in a participatory way, we need a new monetary and financial system. At the moment, every one of us is throwing away about 50 tons of waste in a lifetime. This is furniture, cars, computers, smartphones, everything. Um, a lot of stuff that would be good for use for other people. There is no lack of resources on this planet. There is just a bad use of these resources because we're throwing them away. And that can be changed. And it has to be changed. It can be changed with the Internet of Things, so which we can measure the externalities and the external effects of our actions on the environment and on other people. Like we can map noise and CO2 and all those different ways that we are producing and bad impacts and good impacts too, like in health and environment and so on and jobs. And so the principle would be to increase positive externalities, to reduce negative ones, and to ensure fair compensation. And how to do that? Well, actually, this requires a multi dimensional money system, or incentive system, or reward system, or just a multi-dimensional feedback system based on real-time data. This is what we can build now. It doesn't have to be blockchain-based, but uh, we know we can create money digitally and, and in this way create the feedback loops by combining a monetary system, a multi-dimensional with the Internet of Things. And why does it have to be multi-dimensional? Because a complex system cannot be controlled with one quantity. And money is, by nature, one dimensional. Our ecological systems, even our body, is based on multiple feedbacks, right? So we have feedbacks of carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. We cannot replace it by each other. We cannot trade it off for each other. You need to have a multidimensional system. And this will introduce new market forces. It's not about creating more regulation to enforce a circular economy. No, those new market forces will drive the system towards a co-evolution towards that circular economy. The system is just done well. And of course, the sharing economy would be part of it. Then the resources of the world would be enough for everyone. We could have a higher quality of life for more people. Um, we also first started to, to work on this with the limited means that we have. We have these blockchain and between the same schools with a lot of students highly committed to, to this, highly excited as you can see. We have a very little demonstrator for this finance forces in the social ecological finance system. And so I'm asking you to be a game changer. Um, there's a new game to begin, the digitization 2.0, which will bring us away from the monopoly game of today towards a sociopolis game, a social cooperative game. Network effects make all the difference. We are now in a transition from a component dominated to an interaction dominated world. And so this means we should have combinatorial innovation for the economy, we should have collective intelligence for our society, we should have multi dimensional real time feedback for nature. And so the success principles in a complex digital world would be co-learning, co-creation, coordination, cooperation, and co-evolution. Let's do this together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two questions. Yes, please.
intrinsic knowledge about itself that the requests that have to be searched don't have, I think it would be a combination of bottom-up and, and, and top-down that would be the optimal solution. Not just top-down, not just bottom-up or top-down, but a combination of both. Yes, and I actually, for the sake of time, I had left out a slide, I'm not sure it's in here, uh, which is about the multi-hierarchical feedback rules. But the point about this approach is it gives us degrees of freedom for creativity and innovation. The Chinese citizen score system doesn't do that. It will give you after a minus point for whatever you do. And so people would start doing what the system wants from them and not be innovative and creative. And that's a very much component-oriented approach. And as I said, the next big thing is going to be the interaction-oriented approach because that can create additional benefits. The value in the future will be in the interactions, the most value. Thank you. Further questions? Yeah. Uh, if not, uh, sorry, Emma. <coughs> And then this is again because today we're trying basically, at least some institutions try to do this, to collect as much information you can get from all over the world and then process all that information and put it through a monstrous AI system and we learn all the patterns in there. But you know, it's this future of our society is not about learning how to automate, uh, uh, automate uh, the um, way the society works today. It's clear that we have to come up with a totally different organization of our society. And so learning from the past will not allow us to do this. We really need to, to be very innovative. And, and I, I think the approach that I'm recommending it's using digital technologies, but locally, for local feedback, enabling self organization, it will be more energy efficient, more sustainable, will give us more freedoms, and uh, will be highly efficient. I, I think there is a better way of doing things than we, than we are doing it today, and we are now realizing that we need to change our way how to use digital technology for various reasons, for environmental reasons, for reasons of democracy, also cybersecurity and so on. A word of cybersecurity, you know, nature has come up with a decentralized system. Our immune system is decentralized, and this is what allows us to survive for a hundred years, even though we are bombarded by millions of bacteria and viruses every day. Today, cybersecurity approaches are very, very much centralized and a center that collects a lot of data. And I think this is going to endanger freedoms and democracy if we don't pay attention because the more data you have, the more um, easy you can attack uh, systems, in particular people using computer systems, and so there is an arms race, a never-ending arms race, to collect more and more data about everyone and getting more and more control of everyone. And I think what we need to have is cyber resilience instead. <laughs>